There's not. And perhaps actually in the last five years there have been commentators who have said there's a, a greater openness to talking about religion, where previously it was taboo, there is a greater openness now. But often the sticking point, the barrier to people engaging in uh, Christian things is this inconvenient, problematic thing of church. Do I really have to join a church? And so, uh, firstly, we're going to ask this morning, is it true that God has a purpose to make a sanctuary, a particular place that He dwells? And then we'll ask, why is that better than simply experiencing God on my own, in private, uh, kind of one-to-one? Surely that would be more deep, that would be more intimate. So first question, does God really have a sanctuary within His creation? Has He chosen a place, a particular place, where He dwells? I want to take you to Exodus 15, which is the Old Testament passage we had read out, feel free to turn there. Uh, Sanctuary, the basic definition of the word is the place where God makes His dwelling. The Hebrew is mikdosh, it's from the word holy, uh, and it means the holy place. Sanctuary means a holy place, a sacred place, a place where God dwells. And in Exodus 15, from verse 13, we hear of God's plan to make a sanctuary in the midst of His people, Israel. Israel, the people He leads out of slavery in Egypt. Have a look with me again in uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse 13. You have led in your steadfast love the people you've redeemed. You've guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom are dismayed, trembling seizes the leaders of Moab, the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away, terror and fear falls upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone until your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. And get this, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Did you hear God's purpose in that in that passage? Because why does God lead Israel out of slavery in Egypt? Well, it's not simply to just have freedom to do whatever they want. God has a particular purpose. It was to bring them to the place, the sanctuary, where he would dwell among his people, the place that his presence would be experienced. Now, this is God's purpose from the very beginning of the Bible. In one sense, yes, God's presence pervades the whole of His creation. Creation cannot get away from God after it is made by Him. No, God uh, inhabits the whole world. The heavens declare the glory of God. That is true. And yet, at the very start of the Bible, what do we see? God chooses a particular place, a sanctuary, the Garden of Eden, a place where He will dwell in a tangible way, in a special way, in a way in which His people can encounter Him face to face. And that is the sanctuary. Now, in Genesis, that place, the Garden of Eden, is desecrated. God's people rebel. It has ruined the fellowship between people and God in the fall. And so, what is God doing here in Exodus as He leads Israel as a new nation to the land that He has chosen for them? What is God doing? He is reviving that plan to dwell within His creation. This plan that God will create a dwelling place for Himself to manifest His presence. And so, Moses is given instruction for the first sanctuary, the tabernacle, this holy tent And actually, if you read the book of Exodus, it's a very strange book, if you've read Exodus before, because the first part is action-packed. There's the plagues, there's Pharaoh, there's the Red Sea parting, and then the second half, there's a very pedestrian, boring description of the temple, and often people, when they're reading Exodus, kind of give up at that point, because here's the lampstand, and here's the tent, and here's the walls, and the poles, and everything. But what is the significance of that? Here is the place where God will dwell, 
among his people. Now, later on in the story of the Bible, this tent becomes a temple in Jerusalem, even more permanent, even more glorious as a dwelling place for the God of heaven. And we see here that Israel's sanctuary, the place that he chooses within Israel to dwell, is a new Garden of Eden. In fact, the temple was decorated with palm trees and flowers and and angels. It reminds us of that original sanctuary that God placed in the garden. The temple is a new place within creation that God makes for His dwelling. This is the whole story of the Bible. Now, what happens to that one? Well, just like Eden, God's people desecrate this sanctuary. Israel let in what is unholy. Adam and Eve let in the serpent. And in the same way, Israel let in the worship of false gods. And so, just like Adam and Eve, they too are cast out of the sanctuary. Israel are cast out of God's holy place and sent uh, to exile in Babylon. Well, what is God going to do? He's not going to give up His plan to dwell among His people. He's, He's not simply going to say, well, I'm done with this. He's made a promise. And so, toward the end of the Old Testament, the prophets speak. They speak of a new sanctuary which will come, a new dwelling place for God. And this temple, this dwelling place, will be even better. It will be even more permanent, even more glorious, God's presence. So glorious that it will radiate out and fill the entire earth. And Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, God says through him, Ezekiel 37 verse 26, I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place will be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. And Ezekiel, the prophet, he has this vision of a massive temple, ridiculously large, the dimensions of this temple, way bigger, more glorious than anything before. Now, when Israel come back to the land after the exile, the rebuilt temple under Ezra is nowhere near the glory and certainly not the size of this temple that Ezekiel sees. See, it's not until we turn to the pages of the New Testament, and and you might want to turn now to John's Gospel, John chapter 1. See, here, as Jesus arrives, it becomes clear that all of these places that God chose to dwell uh, previously, the Garden of Eden, the mountain of Sinai where God came down in a cloud, the tabernacle, the first temple under Solomon, the second temple under Ezra, all of these places were just dress rehearsals. All of these places were simply practice for the most remarkable way that God would come and dwell and sanctify for Himself a place within His creation. And what is that place? It is the body of of the Lord Jesus. Here's a surprise. Here's a surprise, brothers and sisters. It is the flesh of the Lord Jesus, the humanity which He takes to Himself that the eternal Son of God assumes in the incarnation. That is the place that God chooses to dwell forever within the creation that He's made. If you don't believe me, have a look at John chapter 1. John 1 verse 14. And the Word, that is the Word who is God, the the Son from the Father, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He, He made His dwelling among us, The word there literally is, He tabernacled among us. He tented among us. In the incarnation, God in the flesh, God comes to make His sanctuary among us. And then as we heard from the New Testament reading, uh, John chapter 2, Jesus speaks of His body in the resurrection as a new temple, which will be raised 
in place of the old Jerusalem temple, which has been destroyed. In the resurrection, God has rebuilt a place for His dwelling. Christ Himself is the sanctuary. He is our sanctuary. More permanent than ever before because of the incarnation. More glorious than ever before because of His resurrection. Do you want to experience God? Do you want to come face to face with Him? Then get close to Jesus. Now, this is crucial. We need to see that Jesus is actually the sanctuary. If we're to understand in what sense the church can be called God's sanctuary. Because when we move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's not just that God used to live in the temple and now He lives in church buildings. No, Christ is the dwelling place of God and the church is the place where Christ is building around Him a temple that will last into eternal into eternity, sorry. Christ is gathering together by His Word and by the sacraments, by His Spirit, He is drawing to Himself a people who will be that final sanctuary in the new heavens and the new earth. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says this, in Him, in Christ, you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. A living temple, as the Apostle Peter says in his letter, a living temple built, being built on the cornerstone of the Lord Jesus, stones built on top of Him. And one day, friends, that this great structure that Jesus is building around Himself will be complete. And in the book of Revelation, the very end of the Bible, what do we see? This great structure descending from heaven, a city coming down, and through Christ and His people, complete, God's presence will fill all of the earth. Now, I realize that took a while because we've gone through the entire story of the Bible. But can you see that sanctuary, God's intention to dwell among His people within the creation, is central to the whole story of the Bible? And it's key to what it means to be the church. Sanctuary is the place where Christ is present. Present among His people. And all the benefits of being the church come from that. That it's Christ who is at the center. Christ who is present. What are church buildings? Are church buildings sanctuaries? Not in and of themselves. Sometimes you'll hear Christians using the language of sanctuary, to speak of a a, a place where Christians gather, or even the word in history has been used, particularly of the very front of the church, the kind of holiest place where, uh, because the word and the sacraments are offered there, this is the, the sanctuary. Well, there's nothing really holy about the buildings in which Christians meet. They're simply rain shelters. There are some very, very beautiful rain shelters. There are some that are more ordinary. But really, that language is used of buildings just through association. Uh, In fact, uh, if you're an Anglican and you don't believe me, John Jewell in the book of Homilies says this, it's not the building that is holy, it's because it's God's people who meet there who are holy, and because they exercise themselves in holy and heavenly things. It is the people of God gathered where Christ is making His dwelling place and building them into a holy temple. Is it just, that, then, on the other hand, is it just any place that Christians get together? For example, for Christians getting together for a potluck. Christians love potlucks, don't they? Uh, or maybe board games. You get together with some Christian friends. I know there's a number of you here who really love getting together for board games, and that's fine. I don't judge you for that. <laughs> but is it just that, Christians getting together and... No, no, this reality that we're speaking of is experienced as people are gathered together in the name of Christ, where prayers and praises are offered, where the Word of Christ is read and expounded, where the sacraments are administered, the visible signs of Christ's presence with His people. And at this point, you may be asking, really, going to church, 
going to church, that is the, in this age, the place where I encounter God in this way, that's where God dwells. Have you been to the churches that I've been to? Maybe you're asking that. For me, it didn't feel like I was being transported to heaven. It felt like a bit like the other place. C.S. Lewis in the Screw Tape Letters, uh, a work of fiction about a correspondence between a senior and a junior devil. Uh, Lewis speaks of the way the devil can easily use the ordinary and awkward nature of the church to persuade people this, this can't really be the place that I encounter God. And it's a powerful tool that the devil uses. Uh, let me quote a senior devil writing to this junior devil says this When he, the new Christian, gets to his pew and looks around, he sees just that selection of his neighbours whom he has previously avoided. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbours. Make his mind flip back and forward between an expression like the body of Christ and the actual faces in the next row. If any of those neighbours sing out of tune or have boots that squeak or double chins or odd clothes, the patient will quite easily believe that their religion must therefore be somehow ridiculous. And perhaps you are sceptical. How could the gathered church, God's people gathered, be this sanctuary? There's a Puritan sermon uh, called Why Public Worship is to be pre Preferred Over Private. And the, the, this Puritan, David Clarkson, gives 12 reasons why you should prefer going to church over just having a private experience of God. And we, we hear that and we think, that's just crazy. It sounds very strange today, doesn't it, to say that. Surely people engage with God in their own way, and many maybe feel closer to God on their own, or perhaps with a few friends or family. But see, if God has chosen a place to dwell, if He has, through Christ, appointed that it is as God's people gather under the Word of Christ, that that is the place that He will dwell, then it's good to seek Him in that place. It is good to seek the Lord in His sanctuary. Why? Why is it good to seek Him in His sanctuary? And this is the second question we need to ask. There's a number of reasons. David Clarkson gives 12. I'm not going to uh, give you 12, but a few to finish. Firstly, we need to see that the greatest saints longed to be in God's sanctuary. King David, known for his deep experience of God's presence, his hunger for God. In Psalm 27, David says this, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. Is, is that what warms your heart? Is, is that your instinct? To seek God in His sanctuary, to seek Him in the place that He's promised to make Himself known most clearly, most tangibly. Yes, in His Word, but particularly that Word dwelling among the gathering of His saints. Do you have that longing to experience God there? David did. In fact, King David, the same psalmist, when he was cut off from God's dwelling place, he realized the great danger that that was. Later on in uh, the book of 1 Samuel, which we've been looking at, after David's been crowned, uh, sorry, anointed, but not yet crowned, he's on the run from King Saul. And during this time, he can't gather with God's people. He's, he's about to be attacked. He, he's uh, alienated from God's people. He's traveling often in Philistine territory. And he feels so strongly about this. He says in 1 Samuel 26, They have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now, of course, Saul, no, no one was saying to David, Go and serve other gods, literally. 
David knew that by being cut off from public worship, he realized what a danger he was in. He knows that gathering with God's people plays such a crucial role in our experience of the presence of God. Let let me remind you, and I I do kind of hesitate to bring this up, but remind you of when the COVID lockdowns ended. Do you remember what a joy it was to regather and reconnect with God's people? Do you remember what a, what a thrill it was at, at that time to see the faces of those that Christ has called to Himself and be able to fellowship face to face, to hear the Word of Christ and His forgiveness, to receive the Lord's Supper again? We forget, don't we? The privilege that that is. I have a friend from uh, Nigeria, from the northern part of Nigeria, who when I first met them, uh, told me that back home at their church, they used to have to go through metal detectors on the way into church because of the frequent threat of terrorist attacks. I mean, it's, it's that that alerts you to the precious nature of gathering with God's people, with the presence, promise of the presence of Christ, doesn't it? When you hear that people, wh- why did my friend go? To hear pumping music? No. To meet with the living God. To hear the Word of Christ. We forget, don't we? Just how precious it is. That's why John and John's vision in the book of Revelation, the very beginning, he gives us this dramatic picture of Jesus a as a powerful, fiery figure standing among seven golden lampstands. And these lampstands represent the seven churches. And Christ is right there in the middle, present in the midst of His people. His eyes are a flame of fire. His voice is the sound of many waters. Out of His mouth a sharp two-edged sword. See, who is present as Christ's people gather? the one whose voice is so loud and so powerful that he can raise the dead from their graves. This one stands in the midst of his church. His word is at work. Perhaps most important of all in the book of Revelation, more than any, points us to this reality, is that the presence of God among his people now in this age anticipates the worship of heaven itself. It is the best approximation that we have within this age of the worship of heaven. David Clarkson, in that Puritan sermon I mentioned, says this, that's his twelfth point. In heaven, so far as the Scripture describes it to us, there is nothing done in private, nothing in secret. All the worship of that glorious company is public. The innumerable company of angels, the church of the firstborn, make up one general assembly in the heavenly Jerusalem. They make one glorious congregation, and so jointly together sing the praises of Him that sits on the throne, and the praises of the Lamb, and continue employed in this public worship to eternity. A taste of that heavenly gathering. Friends, the world is a weary place. Are you weary of dealing with people this week? Are you weary of the world? Come do business with the living God. Enter His sanctuary. Lift up your hearts to the Lord of heaven. Gather in His courts. Because in His sanctuary, as we are drawn to heaven itself, in His sanctuary, He is great and people are small. In His sanctuary, His eternal plans for His people are at the center. And our concerns and agendas fade away. In His sanctuary, His work of building 
a holy people for himself. That is the business at hand. And our disputing and our politics are left at the door. In his sanctuary, it's his unending love which we long to experience in order to be sent out and to love in his name. The church is a sanctuary because God is there. Not just because it's a nice, cozy place with my friends. It is a sanctuary because the Lord Jesus lives and dwells and works. And as hard as it is to believe sometimes, that is what God promises. And so, will you do that? Will you seek the Lord in His sanctuary? Let's pray. Living God of heaven and earth, it would be a great presumption for us to claim these things unless you had promised them through Christ. But this morning we do claim them and we trust and we rest in your promise, in Christ's promise, that where people gather in His name, there He is in the midst of them. And we rejoice that you have made for yourself and invited us into your dwelling place. Father, comfort us, confront us with your powerful love. And Father, in our fellowship together, may we experience the presence of Christ. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.